All right, so let's go ahead and solve this problem. What we have is methane at 25C1 ATM enters a furnace operating at steady state and burns completely with 100% theoretical air entering in a separate stream. So two streams come in. One is pure methane, one is just air. And, but both of them have the same temperature, 25C, and they also have the same pressure, 1 ATM. The products of the combustion exit at a given temperature, 1,000 Kelvin. So this is something new. We haven't solved the problem where the products are coming out hot now. And so they asked the question, what is the heat transfer to the furnace from the surroundings? So we know we're going to calculate a negative answer. That's, that's our key. Okay, it's going to be negative because it's really not into the furnace, it's out of the furnace. Uh, in units of kilojoules per kilomole of fuel, so we realize what we're being asked to solve for is maybe you express it Q dot divided by N dot of the fuel. So you, you've seen that notation before, especially when we had you know, the turbine work per unit mass flowing through the turbine. So you could put it as power over the mass flow rate. Well, here is the rate of heat transfer divided by the molar flow rate of the fuel. What do we need first? We need a, a balanced reaction equation. You've probably done those a couple times. So we have methane CH4 plus some amount of oxygen with 3.76 nitrogen because it's air. And it goes over to 1 CO2. Whoops. Goes over to 1... CO2 and two water vapor H2O. So we find out there's four oxygen in the products. The oxygen balance says that I need two here to get the four oxygen in the reactants. And then I'll have the leftover, which is two times 3.76, which is 7.52 nitrogen. Sometimes you just do the multiplication, and, you know, but it's 2 times 3.76. So that's our balanced reaction equation. Now we apply the first law for our system. Um, we should be able to come up with the equation Q dot divided by N dot of the fuel. Maybe it takes us a few steps from our more general equation down to the sum over all the products of the stoichiometric coefficient times the enthalpy of formation plus the change in enthalpy, both of those on a molar basis, from our reference condition to the current condition. And we sum over all the products and you subtract the sum stoichiometric coefficient enthalpy of formation, the change in the enthalpy from the reference condition so that's all over all of the reactants. Let me pause for a second. Um, does that look good? Do you agree? Is the equation correct? Do I have a minus sign error? If it looks good, give me a thumbs up. Any other thumbs up? Now the details. This is where it gets long, but it's just details. Okay. So this is what we're asked to solve for. And so you say, okay, well, how many products do I have? CO2, H2O, and nitrogen in the product. So I have three sums of positive terms. So I'm going to have N times the enthalpy formation uh, uh, plus the enthalpy at the temperature of the products that are exiting minus the enthalpy at the reference temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. So I like to write it like that. All right. So, and that will be for the carbon dioxide in the products. Then we'll have the stoichiometric coefficient, the enthalpy of formation for water vapor, the enthalpy, this is a molar enthalpy, molar enthalpy, molar enthalpy of the water vapor at the exiting temperature minus the molar enthalpy of the water vapor at 298, the reference temperature, close parent, close bracket, and this will be for H2O in the products. And we have one more stoichiometric coefficient, enthalpy of formation on a molar basis, plus the enthalpy at the exit temperature minus the enthalpy 
at the 298 reference temperature. I struggle, you know, maybe I should put something other than 298 in there because it should be maybe a symbol like TREF, but my handwriting is so difficult to put in some subscript that makes clarity. I just put in 298, okay? Where what do we know about this temperature? Well, we just put in 1,000. We put in 1,000. So I could have put in 1,000 for all of those, true? Okay, before we start substituting numbers, let's now move to the reactants. So for each reactant, we'll have a negative sign in front of it. We'll have the stoichiometric coefficient, the enthalpy of formation. But at this point, we probably have done a few of these by now. So we'll write it for methane, CH4. But if the methane comes in at 25 degrees C, and that's 298 Kelvin, and that's our reference temperature, what is delta H? It's, it's zero. Maybe I should wrote that out. It'll be the molar enthalpy at the inlet temperature minus the molar enthalpy at the reference temperature, 298, for the CH4. And so this is exactly the same because it comes in at 25C, comes in at 298 Kelvin. All right. And then we'll have minus, then we'll have the stoichiometric coefficient, enthalpy of formation, and then we'll have the delta H bar for the oxygen coming in. And then we put minus stoichiometric coefficient, enthalpy of formation, uh, my, uh, plus uh, delta H bar for the nitrogen. Now, sometimes we say this is the nitrogen in the product. Sometimes we say nitrogen in the reactants. All right, so we know that the, they all come in at 25C, and we know the enthalpy of formation for uh, nitrogen and the enthalpy of formation of oxygen is zero, so the enthalpy of formation of nitrogen in that term is zero as well. So there's a lot of terms that drop out. Do you see any other terms that drop out? I don't see any. So let's go ahead now and try and substitute some numbers. So we need to know the number of moles of CO2. Well, that's going to be 1 times. Then the enthalpy of formation for the CO2, negative 393,520 kilojoules per kilomole. And I'm going to leave out the units, kilojoules per kilomole, all right, because I don't have a lot of room. Plus, we have the enthalpy, the molar enthalpy of carbon dioxide at 1,000 Kelvin. Where are we going to find that? How many people brought their appendices? If you do, can you just pull it out? Show me where you're going to get the molar enthalpy of carbon dioxide uh, at 1,000 Kelvin. And if you look it up at 1,000 Kelvin, does it come in at 4, 2, 7, 6, 9? Yeah. All right. And then where do we get the molar enthalpy of carbon dioxide at 298 Kelvin? 298 Kelvin. And does that come in at 9, 3, 6, 4? Yeah. And again, all three of those have the same kilojoules per kilomole. All right. Now, um, that, that wraps up the CO2. Let's do the water. So what is the stoichiometric coefficient on the water vapor? Two. Then we have the enthalpy of formation of water, and it goes out in the gaseous state. That's our assumption. Negative 241,820. And the same thing. Where do I find the molar enthalpy of water vapor at 1,000 Kelvin? Same table as the CO2. And that comes in at 35,882. And then we get it at 298, which is 9904. And I'm going to have to wrap this around. I hate to do it, but that's all for the water. For the nitrogen in the products, it'll be 7.52, so it's still a plus. Then it'll be the enthalpy of formation, zero. 
the molar enthalpy of nitrogen at 1,000 Kelvin, 30, 129, minus the molar enthalpy at 298, 8669, close. That's for the nitrogen in the products. Now, what do we have for the minus sign? Well, we have our fuel, CH4. So we'll have one for the stoichiometric coefficient, and the enthalpy of formation is negative 74, comma, 850 for our fuel, CH4, just to help us, a little notation there. Nothing for the oxygen, nothing for the nitrogen in the reactants. So there it is. And if you are careful with the numbers, you'll get negative 555,570 kilojoules per kilomole as the answer, the Q dot divided by N dot F. Yeah, you'll probably have a problem like this on the exam. Yes, organization of your work will be key to avoiding trivial errors. Right? So try to get a strategy on a sheet of paper, how to write it all out and be tedious and careful. Avoid jumping on your calculator too early. You know, put in equations, then put numbers, then jump on your calculator. Standard recommendation for engineering classes. On the next slide, we have where you find in table A23. We have a column for carbon dioxide, a column for water, H2O. We have a column for nitrogen, and if you needed it also, a column for oxygen. But we often use carbon dioxide. CO2 is really heavily used, so um, we needed to find that H bar, that's the first column, H bar. We don't really need the U bar. We're going to talk about S bar not in a second. But uh, you would pick off this value for H bar, subtract it from the value at 298. <clears throat> That's our delta H bar for the carbon dioxide. And likewise, for the water vapor, we picked off this value minus that value for delta H bar. And for the nitrogen going out at 1,000 Kelvin, subtract from the reference 298. <clears throat> Some books basically said, why don't we just start all the H bars at 298 is zero. And so they don't put H bar here. They put uh, H bar minus H at 298. And it saves the students a subtraction, <laughs> which is tedious. But this book didn't. So, unfortunately, you have to do the subtraction all the time. Grab the extra numbers and subtract. What would happen if the products didn't come out at, what did we do, 1,000? What would happen to our answer if they came out at a, a lower value of 298? Would you... What would, how would the answer be affected? What are we solving for? Q dot divided by N dot F. We know it's negative, so don't get fooled by the negative sign. It's out of the combustion to the surrounding. It's combustion of hydrocarbon, methane. But what happens to the magnitude of that number if the products come out colder? It's larger. And so you can compare. Here it came out of 1,000. Here it came out at 298. So this would be like your heating value. Remember that? That's the maximum heat out. But uh, here it is. If you're uh, exhausting your products at, at a high temperature, you're going to get less heat out. True? Well, what do you think I get just uncovered? Let's see. If we're going in a pattern, we're going for broke here. What is the trend? Let the products continue to come out higher and higher and higher until what happens to Q dot divided by N dot F? Well, what do you mean if it's zero? Q dot divided by N dot F? That means it's isothermal. No, not isothermal. Isentropic. No, not isentropic. Adiabatic. Adiabatic. Insulated. 
it's insulated. That's our kind of Greek key word, right? So it's weird. So you have a combustion chamber, and it's well insulated. So any of that changing of uh, chemical makeup going from reactants to products, which liberates a lot of thermal energy, goes to making the products spanking hot. So you ask yourself, if it goes, if it's insulated, it goes out at the very high temperature. Does that make sense? All right. Well, what do they call that temperature? They call it the adiabatic flame temperature. So you can think of some device. Here's a flame right here. And yes, you can measure that temperature, that flame. And people have talked about different fuels having different adiabatic flame temperatures. Some fuels burn very hot. If you're a welder, you know that. If you've ever done any soldering or brazing, soldering is different than brazing, or welding, you know all three of those different fuels run at different temperatures. Okay, so um, what, what happens to our equation for our energy balance? Well, we have a control volume. Let's put it like this. And so the, the, the reactants are coming in, the products are going out, and the products are hot. We have no shaft work for that control volume. It's adiabatic. And so what happens is the energy released by changing the molecules goes to making the products as high of enthalpy as possible. Normally you report the adiabatic flame temperature for the reactants coming in at 25 degrees C. Okay, so here on the next slide, uh, you could go out to websites, Wikipedia, you would find adiabatic flame temperature, different fuels, where did they get the oxygen from? So the oxidizer is either air or pure oxygen. Anybody ever use a cutting torch? What's a typical fuel? Acetylene. And you have a little knob and you sometimes kick it and you have more oxygen and it's hotter. Anyway, uh, you'll see that if you do have pure oxygen, you have a different adiabatic flame temperature. It's higher. Another way of thinking about it, if you're getting oxygen from air, what else are you getting? A lot of nitrogen. And that nitrogen is going to go out the same temperature of the products. So it takes a lot of energy just to heat up the nitrogen so you get a lower adiabatic flame temperature if you're using air instead of pure oxygen. All right. So um, here's some butane. You can buy butane. I think this is butane from a, a pitcher at Home Depot or something. You know, anybody have a little butane? Yeah. Um, let's take a look. Uh, there's a couple of them down here. This is the one we just saw, methane, and we did it with air. Now our calculation showed, what was the answer? Was our calculation show that it came in at 2,055 degrees C? We go to Wikipedia. Hey, Something's, something's wrong. Wikipedia says 1950 degrees C. We just, in our textbook, you run in our numbers, we got this number. What gives? Why the difference? Why, why the difference? The numbers in our book are wrong. Don't believe them? Probably not that, right? Something else. I covered up the answer. Did you see it before I covered it up? There could be a little water vapor in the air, but that's probably not going to really move it much. But we did have dry air coming in. You could have other things going on. One of them is disassociation of the products at extremely high temperature. Let's say that incomplete combustion, maybe some of it went to CO not just all the way to CO2, that's still able to combust some more and come out. A lot of times you'll see an orangish flame. Maybe if you on a cutting torch, you're adjusting the air-fuel mixture, right? The flame usually starts where it's very rich, and they lean it out. What's that flame look like? Very yellowish. The color is giving off because of uh, um, inc 
not complete combustion. All right? Um, so in reality, um, you may not be able to get that complete combustion. Often you have a little excess air, which would lead to a lower temperature. And often you have real heat transfer out away. It's not completely adiabatic from that flame out in the open space. You can see it. What you're seeing is energy, radiant energy coming in the spectrum that your eye can pick up, the visible spectrum. So this is, how do you like to say it? It's close for our model, which is no disassociation, complete combustion, perfectly adiabatic, no, no radiant energy from that flame. Now that we've solved things for the first law, now we talk about the second law of thermodynamics applied to ideal gas mixtures, especially undergoing combustion. So what's the second law look like? Well, you take a control volume, the same control volume you applied for the first law. What are, you know, you just go back to thermo one, write the first law, second, and the second law for a control volume, where what do you have flowing in? Some reactants. What do you have flowing out? Some products. You could have some heat transfer, Q dot coming in, some shaft work, W dot CV going out, and say, what, where, what does the equation look like? So we're going to solve it for steady state. So the left-hand side usually is put to zero. And what is this term right here representing in our equation? Entropy is transferred with heat, right? Okay, so if energy transfers entropy, and so there is how you model entropy transferred with the heat transfer, where in this equation is the entropy with the other energy transfer, which is the shaft power? Is this equation wrong? Where is W dot, CV? That's an energy transfer. Okay, that's not the answer I'm looking for. Try another. Somebody else try. Why is there not W dot? That's an energy transfer. Why isn't that showing up in my entropy balance? Um, it's not necessarily isentropic. If, uh, if it's isentropic or if it's completely reversible, then sigma dot is what? Zero. Now, if it's greater than zero, then there's some irreversibility. So we have the possibility of being reversible, sigma dot zero, or irreversible, you have a greater than zero, sigma dot. Okay, something else. Why is... The question is why is uh, the mass dot? Why is W dot CV not in this equation right here for an entropy balance? Oh, Q dot is. There it is. That's one of the reasons. That's the best reason. It's the biggest reason is energy transfers sometimes accompanied with entropy transfer. It's always accompanied with entropy transfer if it's a heat transfer. But if it's a work transfer, what's the big difference? It's still an energy transfer, but one of them does not transfer entropy with it. That's the work. Why not? Why not? That's the harder question. Well, you go back to uh, understanding of what entropy is, and this is really helpful as we move back in now. We're going to talk about entropy and second law for a reacting mixture. What is entropy intuitively if you just had to sort of try to explain it? I know it's very hard to explain time. Somebody says, please explain time. I'm dumbfounded. My jaw is going to drop open. I'm going to say, go look at a clock, right? But I, it's really hard to define time. Temperature, the same thing. If you really want a clear, crisp definition of temperature, the physicists have worked on it a long, hard time. But when you look at that definition, it's pretty hard to understand. I would just say temperature is hot and cold. you got a sense of what's hot, what's cold. That's a measure of the scale of the hotness and the coldness. Okay, done. Same thing with entropy. What's it measuring? It's measuring something about the disorder of the material. So in the gaseous state, Molecules are flying all around. Liquid state, they're not flying all around so much. And in the solid state, they're not flying around at all. 
They're pretty stationary. So you have a measure of the disorder of the molecules, and it goes down, uh, then the entropy value goes down. So is a work transfer, think of a rotating shaft. All those molecules, when they're rotating, they're all in sync, aren't they? It's all very organized energy transfer. Organized energy transfer has no disorder with it, so it doesn't change the disorder of the system by transferring entropy. There you go, I tried. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, so when you have a heat transfer, they're just bumping into each other. And so they're just bumping, and so it's higher temperature over there, more energetic molecules, and they're just sort of transferring this random bumping around, and that's a transfer of some disorderness in the system, increasing it as the heat is transferred with it. All right, now what do we have here? We have the molar flow rate, and then we have S bar. This is the same thing what we did when we did the first law. It's just now we have to think and pause and say, what is this uh, S bar? What is my entropy per, not kilogram, but per kilomole of this substance for each of the reactants and for each of the products? There's the challenge. And then we already talked about this term. That's just the irreversibility will generate some uh, entropy production. Okay. Well, then you go back and say, this whole chapter has a long title, and it's ideal gas mixtures and combustion. So when we want to get S bar, let's just focus on ideal gases. So S bar of a particular component in an ideal gas mixture. Does this ring a bell, this type of equation saying, look, it, if you want this, it's going to be a function of temperature and pressure. That property is going to be a function of temperature and pressure. And it's going to be isolated where we get a function of temperature only. And then it'll be a function of pressure only. So this is the temperature dependent part of it. That's the pressure dependent part of it. This one, we're going to rely on a table. It's the t same table where we got H bar. And so we're going to go in and get some, a lot of people did a lot of work to tabulate the entropy. And what does the, here, S stands for entropy. What does the bar mean? Molar basis. What does the naught mean? 1 atm or reference pressure. Reference pressure. And what does the I mean? For that component. So you're going to find the column for the CO2, this column for the oxygen, the column for the nitrogen. And then what does this mean? Multiply by temperature? It's a function of temperature. It's a function of temperature. Okay. Now, what is this R bar? It is the ideal gas constant, 8.314, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Then we have the natural log. We've seen that before for ideal gases. But notice what's down here, P-R-E-F. That's our reference pressure. What do you think our reference pressure is going to be? All the time. All the time. It's 1 ATM. All right. Now, what is this P and what is this Y-I? It's the par a partial pressure. The product of Y, I, and P is the partial pressure of that component in the either the reacting stream or the product stream. Okay. So think about it. A lot of times the products and the reactants come in at a total pressure in that inlet of the same atmospheric pressure. They don't really, a lot of times, don't come in at super high pressure. They come in. So it's often, often, but not always, P is equal to P ref. Well, if that's true, guess what happens? They cancel, and now you just have the natural log of the mole fraction in that stream, in either the reactant stream or the product stream, whatever stream you're talking about. But this is the general equation, how to calculate that entropy. But just like we had to work and introduce this term, HF bar naught, I forgot, what is the name of that term? 
enthalpy of formation. Why did that appear in this chapter? Well, because we're changing the carbon and methane, the carbon and carbon dioxide. We're changing the hydrogen. We're ch rearranging the molecules. This was a great challenge to the people that lived many years ago before us and worked this all out in thermodynamics, and we're thankful for them. But uh, you have to do the same thing in entropy. You got to start talking about a common datum point by which you start measuring entropy. So this brings us to the third law of thermodynamics. Every now and then somebody will ask me, hey, do you cover all three laws of thermodynamics when you teach thermodynamics? Or are you sort of shortchanging your students? I say, I cover all three laws. And the third law, I cover the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. <laughs> they all know it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So the third law, well, it basically introduces that common datum point for entropy calculations. So they talk about the absolute entropy. And what they decided a long time ago is not just to peg it at some 25 degree C or something like that, but they would say, let's do this. Let's think about a pure crystalline substance. Well, what, when you see a crystalline substance, what do you think about the molecule, molecular arrangement of that substance? It's very patterned. You could have an amorphous solid. You could have a crystalline solid. It's very structured in where the molecules are. So think of yourself as one of the little molecules, and you say, I know exactly where my neighbor is above me, to the right of me, to the left of me, below me. It's a crystalline structure. And we're going to talk about entropy, some sort of measure of disorder of molecules. So crystalline structure very ordered, less disorder. And then we have absolute zero Kelvin temperature. What does that mean? Well, you know about that. Can you get a negative five Kelvin temperature? Is that realizable? No. If the physicists work really hard to get really low temperatures, right? So what do they have to do to get a low temperature? Suck the energy out. What happens to the molecules at low, low temperatures? Do they wiggle around with high energy, or do they sort of come to state of stationary location? Now they know exactly where the neighbor is, because he's not even jiggling around up there. He's straight above. And that's how they get this idea of absolute entropy being zero for a crystalline structure at absolute Kelvin. Well, can you get an absolute perfect crystalline structure at zero Kelvin? No, but at least theoretically we're going to start measuring from there. So it's given, it's setting to a value of zero. So you're not going to be able to get an absolute entropy ever negative. Think about it. Somebody says, here, this is, I calculated S bar. It's negative 25, blah, blah, blah. Forget it, buddy. It's not happening. OK? Because absolute entropy is perfect crystalline at zero Kelvin. Can't get any colder. All right. So it's impossible to get an absolute entropy less than zero. All right. It is impossible to get an absolute zero entropy. Well, OK, you can't get down there anyway, but you can't get a negative. Well, this reminds me of a joke, and I must share it at this point in the lecture. We have the first law, we have the second law, and we have the third law. And you know about energy and the disorder and this, but you don't really think a lot of times in energy. But if I did this, whoa, ho, 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 I have your attention. Do I not? Money? So what we have is an analogy. What does the first law say about energy? Energy is conserved. Tell me about money. Money is conserved. Let's say you're a gambler and you're going to go play in Las Vegas, right? This is the joke. Some of you know it. But let me tell it as if you never heard it before. So you go to Las Vegas and you're going to bet and either the casino is going to win at the end of the night or you're going to win at the end of the night. True? But the money is going somewhere. It's going to be conserved. Well, the second law of thermodynamics talks about limits on the transfer of energy between forms. And it really likes to go from mechanical to thermal but it does not like to go from thermal to mechanical. That's hard. So there's this uh, energy is in different forms, and it's easy to transfer between forms one direction, but not the other. Well, talk about you playing with the house. 
here is you, here is the house, which way is the preferred energy, I mean money transfer? <laughs> That's it. So you know. So the first one is, is either you win or the house wins, but the second law says the house always wins. Sorry. Now, what about the third law of thermodynamics? It talks about movement until you get down to zero Kelvin. You know, that's sort of the basics of starting the measurement. So at zero Kelvin, S is equal to zero on a crystalline structure. Well, what's it over here? It says that uh, once you start playing, you cannot stop until you have reached zero Kelvin. The equivalent of zero Kelvin would be you're broke. So that's the third law. You, you, you can't stop playing. Stop. So there you go. There's a little old joke on first, second, third law of thermodynamics. So what do we do? We go to this table and we say, hey, this is explaining now more of the information in the table. We were exposed to the molar mass a long time ago. Hey, we learned about the enthalpy of formation. Skip the Gibbs function. All right. But look at this. The absolute entropy. Look at the notation. S bar naught. Look at the units. Kilojoule per kilomole Kelvin. Look reasonable. And uh, we have all of these values and they're just in the table. Some people did a lot of work to calculate them. We're just going to say it's available to us to get those property values. Let's take a look at some of them. Uh, are there any negative? None. And you shouldn't expect any. All right. Uh, let's take a look at uh, solid versus some gases. Can you see the trend between a solid and some gases? The gases have higher. And if you look down here, there's two waters. Well, water is water. It's both of those waters are at the same temperature, 298, and the same pressure, 1 atm. But what's different? One is in the gaseous state, one is a liquid state. Yes, you can have water in the gaseous at 25 as well as liquid at 25. But look at the difference in the S. What has a lower absolute entropy? The liquid. The liquid. That make, that's all seems reasonable. All right. Sometimes they repeat data and it's to your benefit. So if you take a look at table A25 and A23, what do we see? We see the enthalpy of formation information. Let's take a look at carbon monoxide. The enthalpy formation is negative 110 uh, uh, or comma 530. Look down here at this table. There's carbon monoxide right here in this column. And what do they repeat right there? enthalpy formation. It's helpful to repeat the information, ties it together. Then look at what is the absolute entropy for carbon monoxide at the temperature, 298. Come down here to temperature 298. Look over, absolute entropy. Are they the same value? Yeah, that's great. So it's consistent. All right. Same thing if you wanted to check for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, as well as the enthalpy of formation for carbon dioxide, etc. Okay. But you use this table, you'll need to use that table if you have a temperature greater than or different from 298. Let's solve a problem. Methane at 25C, 1 atm enters a furnace operating in steady state and burns completely with 100% theoretical air entering in a separate stream. So we have the methane, CH4. We have the air entering, combustion chamber, going out with the products. And we have balanced this equation before. We know that if it's 100%, then we have a CH4 plus 2O2 plus, what is that coefficient, 7 point? 5,2N2s goes to 1CO2 plus 2H2Os plus 7.52N2s. Did I balance it correctly? You'll have to do that quickly, right, and do that correctly. Then uh, they tell us that the products come out at this uh, particular temperature of 2,328 Kelvin. 
well, we just solved this problem, and what did we say about that temperature? It's the adiabatic flame temperature for air using our... So what is the Q dot for coming into this combustion chamber? Zero. It's zero. So it's a well-insulated combustion chamber, and the products are going to come out at the adiabatic flame temperature, and it's given to us, so we don't have to calculate it. We already calculated it. What is the rate of entropy generation within the reactor? And they give us this kilojoules per kelvin per kilomole of fuel. So they're asking us to calculate sigma dot per n dot of the fuel. And the answer is 791. So how do we solve for it? Well, wasn't that equal to the sum over all the products? Do, what was our second law? It, uh, let's go back. Okay, go right here. So we're going to have to write this second law. This is zero. It's adiabatic. And so this Q dot, or sigma dot, divided by N dot of the fuel turns into a sum over all the products of the stoichiometric coefficient times the absolute entropy at the temperature and pressure for each of the components going out in the products. So let's write that. So this is the sum over all the products, the stoichiometric coefficient times the absolute entropy of that going out at, at that temperature going out and at that pressure going out in the products. Okay, minus the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient, absolute entropy. Okay, so um, let's now do this. Let's say, what is our N, and then how am I going to write this S bar? In general, we write it as S bar not at the temperature exiting for the product, minus R bar, natural log, and I'm going to put it in here, YIP exit divided by P ref. Okay, parent, parent, bracket, bracket. That'll be for CO2. Then we'll do the same thing for the water. Maybe I'll do my copy and paste. You probably don't like that, do you? Edit, copy, edit, paste, paste. H2O, right? H2O, same equation. And then, well, I don't think I can do it again. Let me try it. Edit, paste, paste. Oh, look at that. <laughs> uh, that's one thing I like about my job. Every day I learn something new. You may not be excited, but I just learned something new today. So Now we have a minus sign. And let's try the paste again. It works so well. Oh, my. This is really going to speed up. Hey, come on. You can't keep up with me? <laughs> You're note taking, you're you falling behind. So this will be for the methane, CH4. And then we have the oxygen, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna shorten this. I'm gonna put a N S bar um, um, for the oxygen and then minus N S bar for the nitrogen. Okay. Let's see, there's a lot of these terms which are going to simplify, right? So our exit pressure and our reference pressure are the same. So that really simplifies these, but I need to get the mole fractions. That's going to be a little tedious, aren't I? Isn't it? But if I take a look out here, I have pure methane coming in right here. So tell me a little bit about what is this mole fraction right there for the methane coming in in its own stream. The Y of the CH4 is 1. You're a good little mathematician wanting to be a mechanical engineer. You know that the natural log of 1 is goose egg, 0, absolutely. So that's kind of neat, isn't it? That that just goes away. All right. So this will go away. Now, uh, because of the natural log of 1. So what is s naught of the methane? We have to just get that out of our table because it's a fuel. It's only in the fuels table, and I can pull that value out for you. The s bar 
of the methane is uh, 186.16. Can we verify that? Let's take a look. Here it is, 186.16 for methane out of table A25. All right, let's jump back. Oh, you can see where I'm getting all these values now. I show you where I get them. Because I've got to do the carbon dioxide in the products, the water vapor in the products, the nitrogen in the products. But before I get to the products, let me spend a little more time over here on the... Um, I shouldn't have done it like that. I should leave more room. Okay, let's do this. So it's S naught minus R bar. Now I'm going to do the natural log of YI4. This is parent, parent for the oxygen minus N S bar naught minus R bar natural log of YI parent, parent colon bracket bracket for the nitrogen. Okay, <laughs> because they're coming in in a mixed stream. They're coming in a stream called air. So when we calculate the N, this yi, that's 0.21 for the oxygen. The natural log of 0.21, well, it's not zero. So it'll be in our equation. And this will be 0.79 for the nitrogen. And we already know what the R bar is, 8.314. Okay, but we need this S naught for the oxygen and this S naught for the nitrogen. Well, you could get them in two places. The easiest right here is this is the S naught at 298 for the oxygen, so that's 205. And then this is for the nitrogen. It's also in the table A22, but I didn't copy it there. So, so this was uh, for the nitrogen. What was it? 205.033. And for the, that was for the oxygen, sorry, nitrogen, 191.502. All right. What is our stoichiometric coefficient on the oxygen? Two. What is our stoichiometric coefficient on nitrogen? 7.52. See how I filled out those values? Okay. Did I do the stoichiometric coefficient on the fuel? One. Okay, now let's, let's go to the hard side, which is the products, carbon dioxide. What I need to do is I need to get the mole fraction of the CO2. Can you see what I do here? It's 1 divided by 1 plus 2 plus 7.52. And then the mole fraction of the water vapor, that's going to be 2 divided by 1 plus 2 plus 7.52. And likewise, so what we find is the mole fraction of carbon dioxide um, comes in at 9.5%. Uh, We're going to need that right there, 0.095. The mole fraction of the water vapor, 19%. I didn't see these calculations were easy, did I? 0 0.190. The mole fraction of the nitrogen is 71.5%. Uh, and so this is uh, 0.715, a lot of nitrogen. Okay. All right. Um, you get these values at the exit temperature. What temperature is it exiting at? I'm going to show you right here. Yes, for the adiabatic flame, we have to do the interpolation. But here is my H bar and my S bar knots. This is what I really need for the CO2. This is my S bar knot for the water vapor, et cetera. Now, one thing in closing I'll just mention. Is this needing to be S bar not at, let's say, 2328 Kelvin minus S bar not at 298 Kelvin? No. So don't get tripped up on that. Okay? It's just S bar not at that temperature minus R bar, then you have the natural log of the mole fraction. Well, with that, this is the final answer. I encourage you to calculate it. Have a safe Thanksgiving. Bye.